Hey everyone, welcome to Board Game Heaven. My name is Raymond, and in this video I'm going to take a look at Block and Key, designed by David van Druiden and published by Inside Up Games, who were kind enough to donate a copy for me to review. This is a game for 1 to 4 players, which plays in about 20 to 40 minutes for ages 14 and up. It's kind of an abstract pattern building game. You're using 3D blocks to build your patterns on top of a 3D temple, and you're trying to match those patterns with cards that you will dealt during the game. And before I start explaining how to play the game and share my thoughts on it, I'd like to ask you all to please hit that subscribe button if you haven't already, because that really does help the channel. And if you'd like to support what I do, there's also a Patreon page you can visit and you can support me for as little as just one euro per month or more. And in return, you will get your name in the credits of my videos, early access, and also access to some Patreon exclusive videos. All right, let's uh, get started with setting up the game. To set up a game of block and key, first, of course, remove the slip cover from the box because the box is a part of the actual game. As you can see, this has a whole grid on it, and this will be the top of the temple on which you will be building your blocks. So you take off the cover and then you just take out all of the material. You have a large uh, bag with all the blocks inside. So you can just take that, put it to the side. This is the starting cube, so keep that apart for now. And of course, all of the cards are kept apart. There are some promo cards inside. And these are the side struts for the uh, temple itself. Then you flip over the bottom of the box, which will have the excavation site and uh, spots where you put your cards. And you take these pillars and you fold them close with this groove on the inside. And then the bottom of these are placed on the table and you slide the bottom of the box over these um, four columns. After you've done that, you simply take the lid of the box and do the same with the top of these columns. Simply slide over the, uh, the edge so that these phalanges are on the inside and these bits are on the outside. So be careful while doing that because you don't want to bend them. Once you've done that, you will have a nice 3D temple and you put that in the middle of the table. Next, separate the moon, the sun and the star cards and give each deck a shuffle. Then deal two star cards to each player, one sun card and one moon card. These are easy, medium and hard objectives. So after dealing those cards to the players, you remove any star cards that you have left and place the remaining sun cards on this spot on the temple floor and remaining moon cards on this spot. Then shuffle the four enigma cards. Each have one player color. So keep them face down, shuffle them and randomly deal one to each player. Any remaining cards are returned to the box and players can look at these in secret to determine their color, but you don't show that to the other players. Decide who gets to be the starting player and give that player the core cube, which is the only cube shaped piece in the game and all the other pieces go into the bag. And then place that cube with one of these green sides, which is the color of the material. These four faces are painted in different colors. So you simply take this or this side and place it on one of these three spots over here on the top of the temple. Now you will notice that these have different icons on them. Um, if you're playing a two player game, you place it on these four spots here and the arrows indicate where the two players are going to sit. So one player is going to sit on this side, the other player is going to sit on this side, and then you simply place it down like that. And the starting player gets to choose which colored side they want to face them 
In a three player game, you choose this square here and the arrows will indicate that one player is on the left, one player on the right and one player here in the front. So no players are over there. And for four players, you place it in the middle with one player, of course, on each side of the temple. Next, going counterclockwise, the player to the right of the starting player will fill the excavation site at the bottom here with cubes from the bag, which they randomly draw from the bag. And you start placing them on them in the indicated number. So this one has a number one there, one dot, two dots, three dots. So you place one here, another one here. You draw some more, third one here, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Then that player takes all three cubes from either a column or a row and then refills it with new ones from the back. So let's say the player to the right of the starting player wants these three, they take those, place them in front of them, and then draw three new ones and place those back on the board in ascending order. Then the player to the right of that player does the same, takes three pieces in either a row or a column, refills them from the bag until you reach the first player, the starting player. They do the same and also refill the digging site. When all that's done, you're ready to play, so let's explain the rules. In block and key, players will be placing their 3D blocks on top of the temple trying to make figures but only seeing those figures from their point of view so you're basically only looking at a 2d image of all of these blocks no matter how far or how close these blocks are you will only be taking a look at these sides from your perspective which of course means that the other players will be having a different perspective than you do so let's take a look at the cards we were dealt here. So we have these two star cards, which are the easy ones, and we can try to make these figures. So they don't have to be exactly next to each other like that. This, these two, for example, or just one of the two, can be far further on on the temple, and this can be closer to you, etc. as long as these are next to each other. Same goes for this, of course, and this and this. Again, here is uh, three brown ones and three gray ones. It doesn't matter where all of these squares are, as long as this figure can be seen in your 2D perspective. And this one is the moon that is the hardest one to make. So for example, if I had the gray faces there, I could take this card and try to make this using uh, this figure. So if I place this, for example, next to the gray piece here, then I could rotate my card and you can see that here on the bottom, now it's exactly next to each other. I have gray, gray, green, green, and that is good for claiming this key card. But this could also have been uh, way in the back if it connected to other pieces. I'll explain the placement rules in a bit. But if this was all the way back there, I would still have these two next to these two. So you really need to turn the 3D uh, grid into a 2D perspective. So let's first explain exactly what you do on your turn. On a player's turn, you can choose one of two actions to perform. The first action is excavating blocks. And this is just like after the setup, then the player simply takes either one column or one row of blocks and then refills them from the bag. So again, for example, maybe I want this column. I take these three pieces, add them to my personal stash. I take the bag, randomly draw three new ones and place them back onto the grid in ascending order. You can have a maximum of seven blocks in your supply. And if you have more than seven after taking the excavate block action, then discard your choice of extra blocks back into the bag until you have seven. The other action I can choose is placing blocks, positioning a block on top of the temple. 
And to do that, you simply take one of the blocks from your personal reserve and place them according to a number of rules that I will explain on top of the temple. And after you've placed the block and checked whether you could claim one or more of these key cards, then you flip over that card or just take it from your hand, show it to the other players and show them where this key was claimed. Then just keep this card face up in front of you and draw back up to four cards. And when drawing back up, you can choose either a moon or a sun card from the decks at the bottom of the temple. So these are the placement rules. You can place a block in any area of the temple as long as at least one corner touches the corner of an existing block. Doesn't matter which color, the colors don't need to match. So for example, if I want to place this block, I can place it here because this corner is touching this corner. I can also place it here, for example, or here, or here. I can also place it just touching faces because then also corners do touch. I can also place it face up like this, for example. And of course, your blocks need to uh, be within the grid spaces so you can place it diagonally like this. If any faces are touching between the block you are placing and an existing block, then your block must be taller than the highest face of the stack that it touches. And to understand that a little bit better, I will explain how a block is made up. So this entire piece, one piece, is called a block. All the individual squares on a block are called faces. And you will only see the faces that are, of course, facing you. The other players will see the faces from the other sides. And some of those might be obscured by other blocks. So all of these individual squares are called faces. A stack of faces is one vertical column of faces in a block. So in this example, my block is not taller than the highest face of the block that is touching. So here on this side of this block, the highest uh, face would be this square over here. And this is not taller than that, it's equally tall. So I couldn't place it here. I could place it again only touching corners. So if I wanted to place this block instead of this block, then I could place it touching faces with this block like so. Because then this face is taller than the highest face in this stack that it touches. So I could place this block touching the face of this block like so because then that face is taller than the highest face on this stack, which is only a single block, even though it is part of this entire block, which is taller, of course, but I only need to consider the first vertical uh, stack that I touch. Also, the highest stack on your block doesn't need to be directly touching the highest stack of the block that you are touching. So I could also place it this way around. My block is still taller than the vertical stack that it touches. Blocks do also need to be placed directly on the temple floor. They can also be placed on top of other blocks. So I could place this one on top of this block, but not like this, because then it would be touching faces with this stack, with this block as well. And this uh, vertical column here, its highest face is this, and this isn't higher. So I could place it like this, and that would be correct. I could also place it like this, and then it would also be touching this stack, but it's still higher. So those are the two basic rules for placing blocks when either they are only touching corners, then anything goes. And when they're touching faces, you have to consider the rules I just explained. Those are the two most important ones. Another rule is that the maximum height of a stack is the maximum of six. So it can go beyond six of these faces in total. A fourth rule is that it is allowed to create a bridge as long as it is a straight bridge. So for example, I cannot make a bridge like this because that is not a straight bridge. I need to adhere to the grid. So if this was placed here, which would be touching corners with this block, so that's legal, then later somebody else could place a bridge on top of these two squares. But this is only allowed if both ends of the entire block are supported. 
So for example, I would not be allowed, if this was the current case, to do this, because then I would create an overhang and that is not allowed. Similarly, it is also not allowed to create an overhang using these pieces by placing it on a higher stack, because then again, there is an overhang with a non-supported face here. If you need a reminder of those rules, they are explained in runes or icons on each side of the temple. So here you see the placement being a diagonal where they touch a corner. Here you see the rule where they touch a face and then that uh, face needs to be taller than the tallest face it is touching, which is this one over here, which is three tall and this is now four tall. And here you see the rule with the bridge overhang. So any uh, overhang is okay, except when there's a unsupported edge. The end of game trigger is also indicated on the temple's columns here. So in a two player game, you need to have 12 of these cards. In a four player game, one player needs to get at least seven. In a three player game, that's eight. And in a solo game, it is 11 turns. Now there are a number of rules uh, how to score your key cards. So first of all, when scoring a key card, you can rotate your key card any uh, amount to find a match, but you cannot mirror them. Now, of course, this card is a simple example. If I just rotate this 180 degrees, it is mirrored, but there are also cards in the game like this one that you cannot simply mirror by rotating it. So it has to be made as it is printed on the card uh, in any rotation. You can only claim a card after having placed a block that contributes to the key that you are making. So if another player would place a block down that happens to make one of your keys, then you can't claim that immediately. You'll have to wait until your turn and then place another block that will contribute to that key in order to claim it. So if, for example, another player had placed this white block next to this brown block on a previous turn and I had this card, then I would have this key, of course, both on the bottom and on the first uh, row here. So we have these two, but you only need one, of course, but I can't claim it since I didn't place that block. So I need to place a block to contribute to that symbol. So I could take another block if I owned this, for example, and then place it like this. I couldn't have it touch faces because then it wouldn't be taller. So I'd have to make it touch only a side, so a corner like this. I could do it like that. Then it would be touching a corner and from my side then this face right here would still contribute to this figure because that would be my first face the second face third and the fourth so the white white and brown brown and then i can claim the card now each face can contribute to any number of designs so if i were trying to get this and perhaps also this, by placing a green block that would trigger both of these. So for example, if I could place something here, perhaps this block, and I would be placing it touching only corners with this white block here. So I would basically be placing it one square forward from that one. It would be touching corners. And now I would have gray, gray, uh, green, green, which is this card and then green, green, white, white from my perspective, which is this card. So I could claim both of them. So it is entirely possible to claim multiple cards at the same time, as long as your placement contributes to the key on all of those cards. So let's take a look at the next card here. So any empty spaces on a key card can contain either actual empty spaces or any colored face. A player only needs to see their key within all the faces on the temple floor. So if I wanted to create this key, I see that I already have three brown faces right there and two gray faces here. So I need to be able to place another gray face on top of this, which I could do with, for example, this block, which I could place 
like this on top of that gray block since the taller faces uh, it's not touching faces only corners but i of course could also place it like this if i wanted to or even like this or maybe i wanted it like this so that means I now have these three gray faces, these three brown faces, and it doesn't matter that there are brown faces in the middle here. That could be anything. I have fulfilled this key, so at that point I could claim it. And this card I could claim by checking here the temple floor. It has two brown ones, one, two, three gray ones, and I need another white one. So if this was still in my possession, I could place that, let's see, over here, not touching the brown one on the back, the block over there, but only touching corners with this gray block so it can be lower because it's only touching corners and then i would have brown brown gray 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 and white and then i could claim this card the end game is triggered after a player claims a fixed number of key cards for a two-player game that's 12 cards for a three-player game it's eight and for a four-player game that's seven and then every player will take one final turn and then after every player has taken a final turn and the game ends, the players add up the number of individual colored faces visible from their perspective that match their secret uh, key card. So in this case, I had the gray card. So I would be counting all the gray faces that I can see from my perspective. So you're not allowed to count faces that you cannot see. So if I had the green card, I wouldn't be allowed to count all three of these green faces because two of them are covered up from my perspective by this white block. So you count up the number of faces of your color, you divide that number by three, round it down, and you add that number to the victory points on the cards that you scored. And those are shown in the top left corner over here. So this has four points, this card has two points, and these cards have one point each. Any key cards that you weren't able to score are of course not counted and the player with the most victory points wins the game. If there's a tie then the player with the most claimed key cards wins the game and if that's still tied the player with more leftover blocks wins the game and if that's still tied then the player earlier in the turn order wins the game. To play a solo game of block and key Simply set up the game as usual, set up the ruins board, uh, draw the key cards like normal. So that is two of these star cards, one moon card and one sun card. Then randomly draw one enigma card showing your color. Place the core cube again with one of these green sides down in the middle square for four players with any color facing you. So since I'm brown, I may want to turn it that way. Fill the excavation site on the bottom of the temple with blocks. Take all three blocks from a single column or row and refill those spots with uh, blocks from the bag. And all of that is the same as in a regular game. But in a solo game, you only have 11 turns. And in those turns, you need to try and score as high as possible. You take your turns as normal, so you check what cards you have, what objectives you want to complete, and then you either excavate by taking three blocks from any column or row from the excavation site and refilling them in the numbered order afterwards from the bag, or you place one of your blocks on the temple. Of course, once again, following the standard rules for block placement. In a solo game, you have to mark your turns as completed by doing the following. If you claimed a key card, then you place it face up in front of you, not on the temple, but I'm gonna just place it here just to show you. So you place it on the table. If you claimed multiple key cards on that same turn, you simply stack them. If you did not claim any key cards, you take one key card from either the moon or the sun stack and place it face down. And you can alternate placing your cards vertically and horizontally to easily indicate the number of turns. And that includes if you took blocks from the excavation site, because in that turn you also don't claim any cards. So then you would take one of these two cards and place them on your stack. 
Then you may check your remaining cards in your hand after every turn and you may discard one key card from your hand to the bottom of its matching altar. So if I thought I would never be able to complete this one, I would simply place that one back to the bottom of this stack. Then, as normal, you refill your hand back up to four by choosing cards from either altars. And then after that, if you added at least one new key card to your hand, you have to enact an Ancients turn, which is technically an AI turn. But you do not do that if you did not add any new key cards to your hand. Then you just take a new turn. So maybe on my next turn, I excavated again, got some new blocks, then I would take one of the cards from either stack, place that here, and then maybe on that next turn, I scored another card, maybe this one, and I would place that one face up like that. So that means I've already done four turns. So every time after you refill your hand with at least one card back up to four, you would take an Ancient's turn. So what is an Ancient's turn? This is the AI of the game. Now based on the last uh, key card that you drew, you need to check the pips and stars in the top right and the bottom left corner of these cards. So for example, this card you will see has one star plus a um, number of pips. This card has two stars, this one has three, and this one has four stars. The pips in the middle there, they correspond with the pips on the excavation site. So as you know, these all have these uh, pips also in these nine squares. So you check the last key cards that you drew, and if you drew multiple cards, again, just look at the last one that you drew. So let's just say this was the last card that I drew after my turn. I would check the stars, that's four, and on my uh, temple you can also see that this corner has one star, this corner has two stars, this one has three, and that one has four stars. So then I take a block from the excavation side below that matches the number of pips. So if this was seven, then this spot, which also has the seven pips right here, would indicate the block that the AI takes, and then it will place them in the corner nearest to the corner with the four pips. So you check the corner with the four pips, then you check the block that is nearest, in this case that's this white one, and that block is then placed corner to corner with that block in any direction that I wish. So I can place it like this, or like this, or like this, even like this. Doesn't matter as long as I'm touching corners, not faces, only the corners with the block that is closest to the corner indicated by the last card that I drew. If two blocks are equal in proximity, to that corner, I get to choose which block I connect to. I also get to choose whether I want to put the block upright or not in any shape or form, as long as it adheres to the grid. If a block no longer can be placed due to the grid being filled, so for example, this was the last block that was placed here, then the newly drawn block is simply returned to the bag and the ancient's turn is over. And just like in a normal multiplayer game, you cannot claim key cards that were completed by the placement of a block by the Ancient. Then after you take your 11th turn, so don't count the Ancient's turns of course, you add up the individual number of colored faces that match your individual card. And again you divide that number by 3 and round it down. Add that number to the victory points you scored. And as normal, any blocks that you still have left or any unfulfilled cards don't count for you or against you. And then you check your total score with the rule book to see how well you did. And those are all the rules for playing block and key. Let's go to my final thoughts. So my final thoughts on Block and Key by Inside Up Games. Let's start with the components. So the components are really good. I like the fact that you get a 3D temple made from the game box itself. That is excellent. The only thing 
I'm a bit worried about is of course the columns here on the side because if the flanges that keep up the uh, bottom and the top get bent after maybe many uses then that might get a little bit wobbly but as it is now it is pretty sturdy you can move it a little bit if you uh, press it hard but it's pretty sturdy so as long as you're careful with it it will probably last for a while but those are the only weak spots that that you know you have to be careful with otherwise the box itself is of a good quality uh, i like of course all of these tetris pieces they are nice and chunky nice and heavy as well they look really good uh, it's it's great that you get a nice uh, looking bag with the embroidered logo on it as well and all the pieces go in here they make a nice clangy noise and you just grab out what you need and i like that as well you put them on the board here i like that the board has spots for everything spots for the excavation pieces spots for the cards that you put on them and here of course uh, the grid where you build your your temple i guess with all of these pieces that looks really good as well all the cards also have a bit of spot uv on them so the moon is shiny the sun rays are shiny the stars on the star cards are shiny which is pretty nice i don't see that often on individual cards so all the cards have that as well and they are of a nice thickness they are very good and sturdy and they are big enough so you can easily see what's on them and the size the scale of these uh, squares match the scale of the blocks so it's a one-on-one -on -one representation which makes it easy to hold it in front of what you're trying to find uh, and makes it easy to recognize if you made a certain key card or not I also really like the uh, slip cover here because when you put all of this together of course this box has the artwork on it for the game but when you put the slip cover over it it becomes an actual game box with a really nice cover the art is amazing it has the golden letters as well that looks really cool look at how shiny that is so that is excellent so onto the artwork the cover art is absolutely amazing i love that very much and uh, the art on the uh, the game board, the, tem the temple itself is also pretty good. Uh, I like the, the style of the art. I like the characters that are depicted on all the sides. I also really like that they put the rules for the placement and for the end game conditions all over the temple so that from every side where you're sitting, you can actually see the rules as a reminder of what to do. Um, and that, of course, again, that the cards have their own spots. Everything is very clearly depicted here. So the art is very well done. And also there's spot UV on the moss here on some of the images on the sides and on the top of these boards. So it's, it's really, really well done. The theme is fun. You're basically excavating pieces of a temple from these temple grounds. Uh, you're taking them out from the excavation site and then later you're placing them here on this site, which is, I guess, the roof of the temple, which you're trying to rebuild somehow. It is, of course, in its core, an abstract strategy game with a pattern building. That's what you're doing. But uh, the theme kind of fits. It, it's pretty, uh, yeah, it's nice. The gameplay, I think, is excellent. I really, really enjoyed playing this. It's just a really fun, tactile game. It's fun to take out these pieces, try not to feel them up too much uh, before drawing them out because it needs to be random, of course. So just quickly grab something, put it down, and then later you're, of course, uh, choosing a row or a column. So it's constantly randomized, so that's good. And then you have your maximum of seven pieces. So you start out with three and then you can either pick more pieces or build something uh, following the rules of placement, of course. So that is a bit of a challenge and you're trying to look from your side, only your 2D view of all of these faces on all of these blocks. And you can uh, block other people's work if you want to by placing pieces where you think they were building and blocking up their colors and making it difficult for them to play something new if it's a high, you know, tall piece like this. So that's also fun to do if you really can't make anything yourself and you need to get rid of some blocks, try and thwart other people's plans. And that there's, so there's a bit of, uh, take that, a little bit of competitiveness there. You're, you're trying to make mostly your own key cards, of course. That's what you're going for, because that's points. But if you really see no other option, you can also just go ahead and uh, make life miserable for the other players. So that's a lot of fun. There's plenty of competitiveness here. 
I love the way it looks. It looks just great on your table, this entire big 3D box with all the pieces on top. It's definitely an eye catcher and it, it just feels really good. These pieces feel good and everything just looks excellent. The gameplay is super, super fun and you're trying to build all of your cards. You're trying to decide whether to go for the easier ones first, you know, if you have something that's just a straight up line of colors or, you know, two and two, the, the easier ones, the star cards that you get from the start are easier than the moon and the sun cards and of course the the moon cards are more challenging so when you whenever you play a card and you need to draw back up you can decide gonna go for a, a medium one or a difficult one and then see what you get and try to fulfill that of course as fast as possible because if you wait too long with your card somebody else might have placed something that screws up your plans so there's a bit of a race element there as well so all in all really really fun gameplay Replayability is pretty high, I think, because everything is randomized. The pieces that you draw from the bag and place on the excavation site, that's randomized. The cards you get are randomized and there are plenty of cards. Uh, so you'll have different goals every time you play. Uh, and of course, everything you build is gonna be different every time you play with different people. They have different goals. They play, play different pieces in different ways and different patterns. So no two games are going to be the same. So the replayability is very, very good. Finally, there's the language dependency. This game is 100% language independent, except from the rules. I got a rule book that is in English, French, and German. So as soon as, as you learn the rules and you can uh, teach it to other players, it's completely language independent. There is no text on the cards. Everything is explained in icons and in numbers. And that's all you need to play this game. So that is also excellent. So this game really scores very well on all those points for me. And if you enjoy play, playing abstract games like this and tactile games and then pattern uh, placement and matching games, then certainly check out Block and Key by Inside Up Games. And I'd like to thank Inside Up Games for giving me a copy to review. I am enjoying this game quite a lot. I hope this uh, video was informative and I hope that you liked it. If you did, please give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. And also check out my Patreon page by clicking the link in the description below or the icon at the end of this video. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next time on Board Game Heaven.